Cairo, Seattle. is your last meal. I'm your host, Rachel Bell, and each episode I interview a celebrity about what they would choose to eat for their last meal. Then we explore the history of that food, the culture, and whatever else we can cram into 30 minutes. Today on the program, Kevin Allison. Kevin hosts the wildly popular podcast and live show, Risk! Exclamation point. Are you supposed to say that out loud? I don't know. It's a storytelling show, quote, where people tell true stories they never thought they'd dare to share in public unquote. Kevin is a comedy writer and actor. You may remember him from MTV's The State in the 1990s, not the 1890s. There wasn't any TV then. Uh, he was also on shows like Reno 911, exclamation point, Flight of the Concords, and Comedy Bang Bang. Actually, it's Comedy Bang, exclamation point, bang, exclamation point. And that's why you're here to edit me. Thank you very much. Plus, he co-founded the storytelling school, The Story Studio, in New York City. Later in the show, Kevin and I discuss a shared love of a beverage shunned by most adults. A lot of people vomiting in their mouths right now. (laughs) (laughs) Screw them! Pardon my French. We will learn the history of the martini with the cocktail evangelist Robert Hess. James Bond's influence was pretty big because suddenly now you see this suave, sophisticated guy going into a bar and ordering martini after martini after martini, usually made with vodka, almost always shaken, not stirred, both of which are the wrong way to have a martini. And in honor of risk, exclamation point, producer Aaron and I discuss the risky foods that I have eaten over the years. Horse sashimi, Japanese blowfish, eating live fish. Um, in Vietnam, I had a maggot pancake. Sorry? I- a maggot pancake. I don't like that phrase. That wasn't very good. They really took a lot. <laughs> really, the maggot pancake wasn't any good. So Kevin hosts Risk, which is basically an R or X-rated version of NPR's The Moth. It's a storytelling show where people tell provocative, controversial, hilarious, and messy true life stories. You don't seem like someone who is shocked easily and sounds like one of your more popular episodes is where you talk about going to a gay man's kink camp. Have you heard a story that was too much for you or that you were like, oh, wow, this is really intense or this is something I wouldn't have expected someone to share? Oh, my gosh. Yes. Many times, actually. Um, So, yeah, a friend shared about a time that she uh, had a psychotic breakdown and tried to murder her mother, tried to uh, stab her mother. And it was so intense, but it was so beautiful because in the end it turned out to be this really kind of transcendent story about how her mother was the person who, through forgiveness and support and love, like helped her get back on her feet and put her life together. I mean, just amazing, just that, you know, the relationship there. Recently, just like two episodes ago, a young woman shared about how she discovered that her father was, I don't know how to, I, I, in interviews, I don't know how to put this politely, I guess into cannibalism <laughs> is the, the best phrase I can come up with. It's a horrifying story and really, really, really like fascinating and creepy. Yeah. What's the gateway to cannibalism? Is it like you're you're like biting your nails and you're like, ooh, kind of take this further. <laughs> I hope not because I bite my nails like crazy. I don't even want to think about it. I, being into like kinky stuff every now and then I'm like, oh, please, please don't let me start being into that. <laughs> 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 So did you always talk about the kink that you were into or did that become something that was easier for you to be out loud and out with once you started doing risk? Everyone who knows me well acknowledges that risk is a natural extension of my entire life because knowing I was gay was literally at the beginning of consciousness for me. And that that's a curse, actually, for a child to be, you know, whatever, three, four years old and just putting conscious thoughts together for the first time and realizing, oh, 
I like boys. <laughs> For me, it was literally just boys' butts. I was like, oh, I like boys' butts. But by the time I was five, I knew what the words gay and fat meant and I knew that they not only meant boys who like boys but that it also meant horrible awful lame something that you should get rid of laughable you know so there was just a ton of fear and terror and shame wrapped up in all of that for me so I grew up thinking when am I going to come out how am I going to come out that's why I became a comedian really that's why I developed those class clown tendencies because I was like, look, there's something really weird that people might find hateful and loathsome inside of me. So can I find a way of being weird? But that's very friendly and that everyone would kind of enjoy. It was that winning formula for me. My first memories of storytelling were at slumber parties. Anyway, so I was going to ask you about your slumber party experience, but knowing that you knew you were gay from such a young age, now I'm extra curious if you did go to slumber parties, how was it for you spending the night with a bunch of boys? Oh my God. What did you, <laughs> what, what Pandora's box are you open? <laughs> Oh, my goodness. I was when I was around, uh, I, I, I guess, 11, 12, 13, you know, right in there. Those I guess that's puberty, pubescent years. You know, I had a lot of close male friends and uh, I was very aware that I was gay. So, you know what I would do? And, and now looking back, I'm like, oh, my God, that's kind of predatory. What I would do is I would be like, uh, hey, wouldn't it be fun? funny if we all went streaking you know oh my god so I can see my friend Don's butt you know that kind of thing <laughs> and there was so there were a lot of shenanigans like that which led to I would say some very light experimentation of touching and it was so funny because I remember one thing guys used to always say in those cir circumstances was, wow, won't this be so cool when we could do it with girls? <laughs> <laughs> and you, that's when you started as an actor in those moments. You got to practice <laughs> right, acting. Right, right exactly. <laughs> Everything that Kevin does is big and dramatic. You can probably tell by the way that he laughs and the way that he talks. And he seems to jump into everything in his life 100%. But when it comes to the way that he eats, he just can't seem to commit wholeheartedly. What would your last meal be? Oh, you know what is so, so funny about this question is that it brings up for me these issues of moderation in my life right now. I have lately been spending as much time as I possibly can trying to be vegan. So, gosh, you know, when I think, oh, what would my last meal be? I think a steak. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a good because vegan. I'm such an extremist, you know? I go through these phases of being so good about eating only almost leaves. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then I'll be like, you know, three weeks of that will go by and I'll be like, oh my God, I'm going to have a filet mignon. And I think that that's actually not so terrible a thing. I, I think that eating mostly vegan and then having a cheat day, you know, once or twice a month is actually, I think, probably a fairly healthy way to go about things. I would have steak and then I would have myself some, you know, vodka martinis. <laughs> Do you have any problems with the labeling of vegan, like having to announce that you're vegan? Because I feel like so much is wrapped up in that. Like a lot of people kind of eye roll it or think that you're a certain way, like, oh, you're a hippie, you know, that you're maybe unrelatable. I'm not sure if this is true for you, but do you confidently walk in a room, put your cape around your neck and go, I'm a vegan? Oh, God, no, never. I'm super aware of it. And that's why if I do say it, I'll almost immediately give the caveat that I cheat. You know what I mean? And that's weird, too, like to feel like I have to make it. There are some places that I find it almost impossible. Like when I go home to Cincinnati, Ohio, you know, it's going to be such an issue with my mom. And <laughs> like, like <laughs> my parents are, you know, they're in their mid seventies. They are Ohio. You know what I mean? Like, like to them, the idea of not eating meat is almost like, what? That like, it, you know, like they're almost like hurt and offended that you're, 
you know, challenging uh, something that's central to their lifestyles. So, yeah, I mean, when I go home to Cincinnati, I'm like, screw it. I'm just going to eat whatever they give me. You know, I, 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 I I think most people who try to be vegan or are vegan, like feel a lot of dread around like going to a dinner party or whatever and being like, mm, do special work for me, you know? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so, so I am a, uh, I am a vegan with plenty, plenty of cheating and plenty of, yeah, well, whatever, not today. <laughs> vegan light. What kind of food does your mom or your parents cook? Oh, my God. It would be, you know, the steaky sort of stuff, meat and potatoes kind of stuff. L- lasagna we were obsessed with in my family. I And I still that, – that would be – like – I had to stop myself from saying lasagna because that's what I would have answered as a kid. You know, uh, that was every birthday was lasagna. Um, so, yeah, meaty, cheesy, potatoy stuff is just like, you know, that that kind of real comfort food is so popular in the Midwest. You know, when you go when I go home, I'm like, oh, yeah, everyone is a little bit wider here. And also when especially if I've I've been really good lately and I've trimmed down, my mom will be, you know, and and I'll feel like I look like absolutely healthy and like uh, whatever the recommended weight is. That's when my mom will be like, oh, my God, you're starving. (laughs) <laughs> That's when she puts cream of mushroom soup in a baby bottle for you and gives it to you when you go to bed. <laughs> exactly. That was another thing. Like, like no one told me that people don't drink like whole milk well into adulthood. <laughs> I had to like learn that several years ago too. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm just an Ohio boy who drank milk with everything. <laughs> I still drink milk a lot as an adult and really no one does anymore. People look at me like I'm drinking gasoline. I can't even believe how shocked people are that I'm just drinking milk. Yeah, yeah. And then there's the milk and other food combos. Like if I'm feeling really bad, I'll have milk and Doritos. And that people is are like, good. What? Yes. Well, yeah. There is milk. You, you, they use like skim milk, I think, to make the Doritos themselves. So, yeah, there's something very complimentary going on there. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's like the intense saltiness that goes well yeah. with like a mellow creaminess because I really yes. love milk with pizza, especially pepperoni pizza. And that's great. And with Chinese food also. And that's pretty salty also. Uh huh. That's amazing. Um, do you when you're gonna have a there steak? Are a lot of people vomiting in their mouths right now. <laughs> Screw them. For his last meal, perfect angel vegan Kevin Allison wants a rare steak, most likely a filet mignon and a vodka martini. When we come back, we're gonna learn all about the history of the martini, perhaps the most iconic and classic cocktail of them all. But before we talk about booze, we have to talk about booze. Hey buddies, we're back and we're going to unlock the secrets of the martini. Seattle's Robert Hess calls himself the Cocktail Evangelist. He has a web series called The Cocktail Spirit, where you can learn to mix up classic cocktails. So let's first talk about the history of the martini. In my mind, it seems to be one of the most classic drinks and something I think a lot of people like to order because it seems classy. Uh, So where did the martini come from? Well, the martini is a drink that evolved back in the 1880s about. Can't really pick the exact date or who did it, or what the exact first recipe was, but sometime in the 1880s. Um, it basically was the the younger sibling of the Manhattan, which is a drink of a similar style that was probably invented in the 1870s sometime. How is it a sibling? Because one is clear and one is brown, and I find one to be more sweet than the other. Well, to think about the siblings, you need to understand the cocktail itself and the family tree there. The cocktail itself gets its start from probably around 1800. Um, the very first time we see the definition for cocktail in print is in 1806. Um, and there they define the cocktail as being spirits of any kind, sugar, water, bitters, which if the spirits of any kind was whiskey, you'd recognize that today as what's called an old fashioned. And for you know several decades, if you ordered a cocktail, you would order a gin cocktail made with gin, sugar, 
water uh, bitters. There was no other names going on back then. And then sometimes in the, like the 1860s or so, other ingredients started coming into the bartender's repertoire, one of those being vermouth. And the bartender started playing around with vermouth, and suddenly this new style of cocktail came about that no longer fit the pattern of spirits of any kind, sugar, water, and bitters. And therefore, if you wanted a cocktail made the old way, you had to ask for a old-fashioned cocktail, and that's where the old-fashioned comes from. So the martini in the Manhattan kind of, you know, caused the birth of the concept of a quote-unquote old-fashioned. Oh, that's really cool. So what exactly is a martini? That's a really good question. We mentioned the Manhattan already. And if you were to go back to the original recipes that you saw for the Manhattan back in the late 1800s, it's almost identical to the way they serve them today. The martini, nowhere near the same. So the, the original, some of the original mar- uh, recipes for martini called for gin and vermouth, w- which is normal, and bitters. Now, remember I mentioned that a cocktail originally designed as having spirits of any kind, sugar, water, and bitters. Yes. Bitters became the defining ingredient for anything called a cocktail. Clear until prohibition. If it was a cocktail, it absolutely had to have bitters in it. So the martini originally had bitters, what's known as orange bitters. Now, I mentioned gin, vermouth, and bitters. The vermouth in a martini was originally sweet vermouth. If you wanted to use dry vermouth the same amount, you'd ask for a dry martini. And that is simply swooping the vermouth from sweet to dry. You will notice there is no mention of vodka, which is the martini Kevin requested and a martini that lots of people order regularly. Robert says vodka didn't find its way into the martini glass until about the 1960s. And it wouldn't be right to talk about martinis without sipping on one. So Robert was nice enough to bring the fixings for four different versions of a martini. Uh, He came in the door with this really cool old black doctor's bag uh, and he opened it up and he had all of these little glasses and he had crystal pitchers and the really nice stirring sticks, the crystal stirring sticks. And he had already proportioned and measured out bottles of gin and vermouth. And so what I've set up for you now are four different variations of martini. On your right-hand side is like the original martini made with sweet vermouth. On, and it's the only one that has a brown issue. The other three are clear. Right. So it's got the, the brown, it almost looks like a Manhattan. Mm. And that one I made with uh, beef eater gin, martini and Rossi sweet vermouth, and a, and a special kind of orange bitters that we actually make ourselves at home. Uh, we kind of DIY our bitters. And then, of course, all of these martinis have a twist. They do have a twist. I can accept a martini with an olive. I like olives as much as the next guy, if, if not better. Uh, but I think that I like the, the characteristics that the lemon twist does on a martini rather than the brine of the olives. I'd much rather have the olives sitting on the side so I can snack on them because they make a wonderful snack. Uh, but they don't do that good in the drink itself, I don't think. Yeah, that's how you served it to me. So I have my martini and then I have a little cup here full of olives. Yeah. So you just kind of snack on them as you go. Yeah, yeah. I think they work good for that. Okay, so no olives in the actual drink which is actually my favorite part of a martini. I don't really like martinis, so I like mine dirty so that I can not taste the cocktail at all is basically what you're doing when you pour olive juice in there. As for the twist, which does belong in a classic martini, Robert sliced off long chunks of lemon peel using a small knife, and then he squeezed the peel into the drink, sending a nice mist of citrus oil onto the surface of the cocktail. And all of the martinis he made for me were stirred, not shaken. You don't want to shake a martini, you want to stir a martini. There's a rule of thumb when thinking about cocktails. Some cocktails you want to shake, some cocktails you want to stir. Notice the drinks in front of you, they're clear ingredients. They're all perfectly clear. If I were to shake any one of those martinis and pour it back in the glass, it's going to look like swamp water. It's going to have bubbles in it, it's going to have foam on the top of it that looks ugly, um, and it's not going to be a very pretty presentation. The drinks you want to shake are the drinks that are cloudy already. Either they got a lemon juice in them or milk, Okay, so no olives, no shaking, and imagine what people drink martinis out of. You can picture it right now. It's that big V-shaped glass. Robert says you're doing it wrong. Yeah, because these aren't the classic V-shaped martini glass. They look kind of like a small red wine glass to me. Yeah, and this this would be a glass that actually they would have used for, for cocktails uh, back in the old days. One of the things I'd like to point out, is, and, and your, your audience can't see this, is that all the glasses I have here are relatively small. They can hold maybe like a four ounce drink and have a little teeny bit of headroom. These drinks have like two ounces of booze in it. 
two ounces is what you want to have in a cocktail because anything more than that, and you, you're just going to go in La La Land in, in, in pretty quick time. Nowadays, if you go into a lot of these glassware stores, you'll see glasses, six, seven, eight, nine, maybe even 10 ounce glasses. And so I think one of the biggest things I can say is when you're buying your glassware for cocktail, and if you're going to do cocktails like martinis and Manhattans, which are all booze, get them like five ounce glasses. Five ounces is like the perfect size for a really good martini glass. What is the strangest thing you've ever eaten? Have you eaten brains, eyeballs, frogs, butts? Well, I have eaten a lot of funky stuff. No frogs, butts, though. Uh, it sounds kind of dumb to say, but eating weird stuff is kind of my thing. Producer Aaron and I will talk risky foods after this break. Bye. <laughs> Kevin Allison has a podcast called Risk, exclamation point, which was also a perfume in the 80s. Did you know that? Is that true? I did not. Yeah, that was like a really popular drugstore perfume that we all wore in like fourth grade. Like with Debbie Gibson's Electric Youth? Yes. I, I was just going to say it would have been right next to that on the shelf. <laughs> exactly. Uh, anyway, when we were thinking about risk, we started thinking about risky foods because I happen to be somebody who, when I travel abroad, I try to find the strangest things that I can eat in that country. And yesterday I decided to make a list of all the things because I didn't think I'd be able to bring them all up. And it's a long list. Yeah. I've eaten some nasty things. <laughs> Uh, by the way, producer Aaron is joining me for this segment. Hello. Are you someone who will eat something out of the ordinary? I will eat almost anything, especially I've been, I, I did some traveling in my early 20s and it's uh, culturally insensitive a lot of times to not eat things yeah. that are given to you. And some of those things are pretty outrageous. Should I just read my list? Yeah, let's see what you got. Give me, okay. the, give me the hot take. Okay. Maybe I should say the grossest first. Give me the grossest first. Okay. Don't bury the lead, Rach. Okay. This was actually delicious, and if I didn't know what it was, I wouldn't have even thought it was gross. I didn't think it was gross when I found out what it was, but when you tell people that you ate the sperm sack of a cod, mm -hmm. they don't always react well. So it was very creamy. Uh, it's a delicacy in Japan. I only had it at really nice restaurants. It's called Shirako. Uh, and yeah, it's cod sperm sack. So I ate that. I lived in Japan for a year. Um, I ate a lot of stuff when I was in Japan. I had horse sashimi. Ooh, yeah, I've had horse. You have? I have. I did not care for it. I thought it was fine. Hmm. It wasn't bad or good. Um, I did have the blowfish that everybody talks about in Japan that's supposed to be really risky. Only instead of having it at a restaurant, we just bought it pre-sliced at the grocery store, which I didn't even hmm. think was possible. <laughs> and we barbecued it. It that, was fine. When you when we talked about doing risky foods for the show, that's the first thing I, I thought of was that Fugu. blowfish that, yeah, will yeah. kill you if it's prepared wrong. And you grabbed it off the store shelves? Yeah. We just barbecued it up. All right. The thing that is the most controversial is live fish. So I was living in Japan. Uh, we found this restaurant an hour away from the town I lived in, which was called Kanazawa. It's up on the Noto Peninsula. And there's a couple places that are known for serving live fish. So you just get a small bowl of water. They scoop them out from the sea outside. And they're really small. They're probably like, how big is that? Like an inch and a half. An inch and a half long. Very skinny and um, transparent. You can see like their little bones and stuff. And they gave us about a dozen each in a bowl. You have to pick up the fish with chopsticks and then you dip the live animal into soy sauce Whoa. and put it in your mouth. I wanted to do this. I arranged this trip. But then when I was sitting at the table, I got super freaked out and I couldn't do it. It took me forever. And then they're really hard to grab, you know, because they're swimming around and you have, sure. to, you have to catch it first. Um, after I ate a couple, because you put it in your mouth and you feel it going boing, 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 <gasps> you have the choice to either just swallow it or chew it. Right. So then we started doing what some people might think would be kind of mean. Like we would put one in our mouth and really let it boing, boing around. Like, you know, it's kind of trapped in your mouth. We discovered that after doing that, if you bit down on it, it tasted really bitter. And I think it was its fear. You sure. tasted the adrenaline of the poor fish that you trapped in your mouth. I, I would believe that. I, I don't think I could bite down. 
I, I think I just have to like go like, you know, goldfish at the frat party, just straight down the gullet. Yeah. Yeah. It's got a little savage. So I put it up on YouTube because I had a blog and I needed to post it to my blog via YouTube. Mm -hmm. I got so many comments. I mean, these videos have thousands and thousands of views and people were really angry. I had to turn the comments off because they were wow. like, you're a murderer. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but... You know, all that it is is perception because if you eat fish in any form, somebody's killing them. Yeah, I guess maybe right. it's cruel to do what we did, letting it bounce around in your mouth. Um, but with all of these foods, I guess I'll just read you my list. Horse sashimi, Japanese blowfish, eating live fish. Um, in Vietnam, I had a maggot pancake. Sorry? I a maggot pancake. <laughs> I don't like that phrase. That wasn't very good. They really? took a lot. <laughs> really? The maggot pancake wasn't any good? They took a lot of maggots and um, mixed it with a batter and then fried it into a little pancake. Oof. Um, at that same stand, it was at a big outdoor market. I also had a bunch of fried mealworms, which were really mm -hmm. good. Yeah, mealworms are good. Yeah. Um, we used to, so the, the group I traveled with uh, overseas, we used to train people to go. We used to train groups of people. And one of the exercises we would do would be about eating weird foods overseas. So we had a speaker one week and he made cookies for everybody. And what he didn't tell the, the students was that there were mealworms in this cookie. There were a lot of mealworms. So he gave them all out and people ate them. And then he talked about how hey, weird food's only weird if you're not used to it, and you guys just ate worms. And some people were like, oh, my God, that's ridiculous. And some people were like, yeah, I, uh, that was okay. Like, I didn't, I didn't even notice. And Cue he's like, the projectile vomiting. Yeah, that's right. No, nobody did. It actually worked really well. The punctuation mark, the exclamation point, if, if you, you will, will. Uh, was that we all eat hot dogs, and there's pretty much nothing grosser than hot dogs. Absolutely. Really look at what's in it. And it's all cultural perception because we like to say, ew, that's gross. Ew, that's gross. It's only gross because you didn't grow up with it. I mean, I've even had people comment about how strange it is in Japan that they eat fish for breakfast. It's like your body doesn't know what food goes in at what time. You know, like nothing is weird unless you make it weird. That's right. I mean, in other countries, they eat bugs, they eat guts, but like it's kind of weird to drink milk and to eat eggs. So, if your friend had a baby and said, do you want to drink some of my breast milk? I'd say 99% of people would go, no, that's so gross. But we drink cow's breast milk every right. day and it's from another species. And then we eat eggs and that's, you know, an unfertilized baby chicken. We don't think that's gross. Well, you just pick and choose what works with your brain. Yeah, I was dry heaving during the placenta episode a couple, a couple were, weeks ago. Yeah. And meanwhile, I'm eating unfertilized eggs constantly. Exactly. On that note, I have eaten balut, which um, is really popular in the Philippines. I had it in Vietnam. Um, it is a developing bird embryo that you eat out of the shell. So you crack it open a little bit and you see the tiny, tiny baby little chicken curled up in the egg and then you eat it. That was also a little rough, I will say. Um, in Japan, I ate pig ears quite a bit, which are delicious. I think they smoke them uh, and you eat them as a bar snack. They're really smoky and chewy and you just have a big bowl of them and you drink beer and eat pig ears. Recently here at the radio station, I had a tempura tarantula that was delicious. Really? It tasted like soft shell crab. I think when you fry things, that makes sense. they're just good. I've had chocolate covered ants. I've had fried grasshoppers and crickets. Um, I started eating chicken feet at a really young age because my family went out for dim sum a lot. And I started eating chicken feet when I was like three. So I still like those. And then I've eaten beef tongue. I've cooked beef tongue. I've cooked beef heart for the podcast. Mm -hmm. I've eaten alligator in the South. Uh, in Alligator's great. Alligator's so good. I love it. It's like a mix between fish and chicken. It is. It's the chicken of the sea. It is the chicken of the sea. Yeah. I would say the most graphic thing that I ate besides the balut was in Peru. Uh, they call it cooey, but it's guinea pig. Oh, yeah. And I ordered it and it came out on the plate whole. And there were mashed potatoes and one of its little paws was in the mashed potatoes. No. So if you lifted it up, there was a tiny little handprint. No. <laughs> but they have... You know, they keep the teeth in, um, the eyes are still in, yeah. the whole thing is on the plate, and you can still see some little singed hairs and stuff. It has its little ears and a little tail. Um, it's not that good. There's not very much meat on it. You have to skin it yourself. You have to kind of hold the head down and pull yes. back the skin. I wasn't grossed out by it, 
My boyfriend at the time who had a guinea pig growing up felt a little sad and he kept calling this guinea pig Winnie, oh. which was the name of his. Ooh. But that was pretty graphic. And then we also had alpaca steak in Peru also. Oh, how's that? Pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I bet. Pretty good. I had a very similar experience to your guinea pig with a sheep's head. Uh, I went. I was living in Kyrgyzstan for a couple months, and I went to a friend's village, and they just wanted to roll out the red carpet for me and my two American friends. They had never met any like white people before. Yeah. So they're like, "Oh, we're gonna do this thing that honors you. It's a sheep's. It's a it's a sheep's head," and they go to the market. They buy a fully fuzzy, just swarded off sheep's head. They take it out into the front yard. They light a blowtorch, torch all the hair off of it. Are you watching this whole process? I'm watching the whole process. Then they go back into the kitchen. They just drop it into a, a bowl of water, boil it. I don't think they used any seasonings, and then dropped it on a plate. So it is straight up just looking at you full on. And, and it was the same situation. You cut off the ears, you eat like the cartilage inside of the ears. You have to take off the skin from the face, and that involves like carving right down the middle of the face and sort of peeling it off. And then when all that's done and the tongue and the eyes, they the, the father came over and he turned the skull over and sort of stuck a big knife in it and like ratched the thing open. Ooh. And then you just eat the brains from inside of the head. I think the most offensive part is that it wasn't seasoned. I, it was so bland and gross. It sounds so bland. Just boiled, put a little salt on that brain. Boiled skin is not appealing. Is there anything you wouldn't eat? No, I no, I don't think so. And I'm including long pig. Me too. I'm in, I would I'm totally eat a flesh. human, but it would be such a special circumstance because I wouldn't want somebody murdered for me to eat. Of course. I don't want to eat somebody who's already dead who's diseased. Yeah, no, that's so a bad idea. Somebody would have to donate their body to the culinary world who was healthy and robust and then I'd try a little piece. I think I would too. And I, I'm pretty sure you're the way you're supposed to answer this question is only in a survival situation. Yeah. But that's not me being honest. No. Uh, if it was a controlled situation and, and everybody, including the donor, was on board and things were prepared uh, in a in a you know disease free way, yeah, I'd, I'd, I, I'm too curious. But like you, I imagine. You just gotta try. Well, should we make a pack? Whoever dies first gets to eat the other. Rachel, it's on wax. Let's shake we on just it. just recorded it. <laughs> a lot of people vomiting in their mouths right now. <laughs> <laughs> and that was Kevin Allison's last meal. Kevin Allison is the host of the Risk podcast, and he does the show live all over the country. Go to risk-show.com slash tours to find a live Risk show near you. Thanks to my own personal bartender, Robert Hess. You can watch his cocktail tutorial videos at smallscreennetwork.com slash cocktail underscore spirit. This episode was produced by Aaron Mason and me. Original music by Prom Queen. And if you like the podcast, we would love it if you subscribe and even better, leave a review. It helps other people find us. Speaking of finding people, you can find me on Twitter at I'm Rachel Bell. It's B-E-L-L-E. And on Facebook, you can do the old facebook.com slash hello Rachel Bell. I'm Rachel Bell. And until next time, this is your last meal. Go to risk dash show dot go to risk dot. Go to risk dash, go to risk dash, mother, oh my God. It's like becoming a verbal tick. <laughs> <laughs>